Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've already had several conversations where we're talking about innovations and bubbling excitement of new ideas of how to change um, our systems. Uh, my role is to talk about how we make structural reforms. That is, if we were all to agree on what we want to see changed in policing, how could we bring that about? Which is a much more challenging thing than the excitement of the uh, bubbling new idea. And fortunately, we have a good history to draw on how, how change has been made in policing institutions. Uh, there's a long trajectory that goes back to the 1920s, so there are five elements that I've um, identified for you to keep an eye on as you're thinking about how technology influences all these things and then how they relate together. The first is leadership and organizational management, and this was the trend that dominated from the 1920s to 1960s, both having a chief with a vision and a, a, a view on accountability and then putting in the organizational structures to run a department. It's still the case that poorly run organizations lead to bad practices. Second is legal standards, and this was both constitutional law and uh, legislation. So as you know, in the 50s and 60s, we saw a proliferation of legal standards where the court was saying, you have to stop beating suspects into confessions. Uh, this was powerfully uh, described recently in uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Devil in the Grove, which many of you may be familiar with. And this was especially true in the South where uh, African Americans who committed crimes or alleged to commit crimes against uh, white people were, were savagely beaten until they uh, confessed uh, falsely to uh, crimes. Um, this court had to escalate and escalate the legal standards that applied to the police department to actually get um, the, the police departments to adhere to them. Department policies can't go uh, unnoticed. They're obviously um, not the most exciting area, but they've had meaningful effects. It's really um, departmental level policies that have led uh, over the since the 70s to a decrease in the use of lethal force and the avoiding of um, dangerous high-speed chases as just a uh, few of many examples. Though um, internal enforcement that goes with those policies um, proved inadequate, and so in the 70s you started to see new experiments in external oversight. As one uh, example of the turn of a turning point, consider the 1966 uh, uh, move by the New York City to change the New York City Complaint Review Board from one that was dominated by three police officers to one that added four civilians. And then you start to see further um, experimentation and changes in external oversight to today when we have auditors, inspector generals, and monitors of court um, consent decrees. These are all very important to the ecosystem of changing policing culture. And finally, to technology, and this exists both in the hard form of less than lethal weapons, dash cams, and as everyone's talking about today, body-worn cameras. Um, but I think importantly, and, and missed often by um, reformers folks in the room here who really want to change um, policing and prove it, is the sort of internal software um, potential for things like early intervention systems. This was an innovation that came out of um, lawsuits by the Department of Justice against police departments that showed pattern and practice problems, and as a tool that collects data about individual officers that are uh, warning signs in effect or things to be aware of, and then are aggregated with an algorithm, raise a red flag for an officer to uh, receive more review, to, for the sergeant to check in on them to uh, see what's going on. So the factors that go into the database can be number of um, absences, number of sick days, number of uses of force, number of citizen complaints, um, other factors like that. And these are systems that can be extraordinarily helpful if they're done right and, and maintained, but if they're done partially or abandoned, then they just become an expensive distraction. And so I want to challenge particularly this group uh, to think about how we could modernize and update that um, early intervention system, which can be truly transformational. How can we make that, um, that system as easy and convenient to use as your favorite car sharing app? Um, but really, all those things have to be taken into consideration together, how they relate to each other, how they relate to all the other factors that influence the ecosystem of policing. There are, of course, many organic developments and external forces that impact that ecosystem from trends in policing to crises like 9-11 or Ferguson, um, to institutional factors like police unions and federal funding. And those um, elements of the ecosystem can either support and encourage your reform efforts or they can utterly destroy them and they'll uh, be forgotten and the police problems that we're all here today to try to improve upon uh, will recur. 
Um, I'll leave you with one hopeful example, which is largely viewed by folks in this field as the most fertile period of reform to police, and, and it reflects the coming together of these five different elements. In 1992, Rodney King is beaten. Um, in response to that videotape beating and the riots that ensued, Congress passed a law in 1994 allowing these pattern and practice lawsuits by the Department of Justice against police departments. A number of lawsuits followed. They were settled in court-ordered consent decrees, and this was around the time that we were still seeing a great deal of attention to police abuse because of high-profile incidents like the killing of Abner Louima and the um, savage beating of, um, of uh, uh, excuse me, of uh, killing of Amadou Diallo and the savage beating of Abner Louima. And these, um, these consent decrees brought in new policies, but also the policy development and the internal training that goes with it. So they were improving organizational management as well as changing um, policies. It brought in the technology of the early intervention systems that we talked about. The law itself changed the legal standard, and it brought in court-appointed monitors to, um, to provide that external oversight. So as you're today brainstorming and thinking about creative new ways to improve uh, the criminal justice system and policing, we won't finish today, but um, uh, as you do your work, please consider all of these elements, how they relate to each other and how we can build toward the common understanding we get today of how to improve uh, policing systems. Thank you.